We know we're going to use probability and random variables and modeling to describe data structures like hash tables and bloom filters and other things we'll see later. But we made an assumption, right? So when we said that we could use the balls and bins model to analyze hash tables, we made an assumption, which is that the hash function, the function that spreads the items out across the buckets of the hash table, has these two properties, the same properties of the problem setup of throwing balls into bins, which is that they have to have uniformity and independence. So every bin in the table is equally probable, and then the allocation of an item in one uh, bucket doesn't affect how, whether another, an, another item gets allocated to that same bucket. You know, the items are being treated independently. So, we certainly are hoping that these are properties that hash functions can provide for us. Right? So, but how? And in what sense do hash functions really provide those properties? Okay, and it's going to involve randomness. You know, we want the hash functions to essentially make arbitrary random decisions about where to allocate items, how to allocate items to buckets. But how, do the, how does it use randomness? Where does it use randomness? What kind of randomness does it need? Those are going to be some questions that we address from here on in. But there's a unifying theme to pretty much all the approaches that we'll discuss in the coming lectures, which is that they use hash functions. And those hash functions have a random element and that random element has to be decided at some point. And that's what this lecture is purely about, trying to set up those ideas. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, here's one idea for how we could design this hash function that's going to include randomness so as to make the allocations to different buckets random. Let's say it makes use of a library function called truly random which goes and generates you know, the best quality random number it possibly can. Maybe it's interrogating different chaotic processes that are going on in the world at any given moment and combining several of them. And it's just going and getting as good randomness as we can possibly get. And it's returning a random integer. Okay, so here we're, here's, here's our library function, truly random. And let's say my proposal for what our hash function should be. So here's our hash function. It takes an integer as a, as, a, as a parameter, it returns an integer, which is going to be the bucket, you know, the offset of the bucket to which item x has been assigned, and I'm simply going to return truly random, or maybe I should really say, you know, truly random modulo uh, the size of the hash table n, you know. But at any rate, it's going to return something that's just basically that it drew fresh from the random number generator. Okay, is this going to work? as our hash function? Well, I see a couple things not to like about what we have here. So first of all, uh, the first bad sign is that this is going to be non-deterministic, which is to say we might get a certain item as input to this hash function today. You know, some item comes in as x, and it's the first time we've seen x and we're inserting x into the hash table. And then tomorrow we might get a query and that same x is being provided as the input to the query. And if our hash function simply returns a fresh random number each time, then there's no guarantee that on the next day, the hash function is going to map that item to the same bucket that it did yesterday. And that violates the basic premise of what we want to accomplish with a hash table, right? The whole idea of assigning items to buckets is that if we then go to query that item later, it's going to send us to the same bucket where we inserted it. Right? So we don't have to search the whole table. So the first bad sign is that this hash function doesn't have that property. Right? It's going to assign items to random buckets no matter what. And then the other bad sign, is that, which is related to the first one, is that the output doesn't depend on x. Right? So the, in, the items coming in and the bucket that we assign that item to in no way depends on the value of x. These two are related, right? Because part of the way we're going to solve the problem of it being non-deterministic is we're going to make it highly dependent on the value of x. OK, so this was not such a great idea. This is not what we mean when we say that the hash function is random. We don't mean that it generates a new random number and that that identifies the bucket where we're going to put the item. So what's the hash function going to look like instead? 
Well, it's going to look a little bit like this, and it's going to look mysterious at first, right? So we've got our hash function, same, it still takes parameter x, still returns an integer. And inside that hash function, there are going to be some variables here called a and b that have random, uh, that there's going to be random numbers in the function. All right, so a and b have uh, basically random numbers. And then the hash function itself is going to do something. I'm not going to tell you exactly what yet. We'll talk about uh, hash functions. I have an example later on the slide. Uh, but it's going to return some function of the input and those random numbers. OK, so for example, we might have a family of hash functions, h sub a comma b of x. a and b are now subscripts to the hash function h. But as you can see, they're also sort of like parameters that are being given that specify these two random numbers. And that what comes out is, let's say it's a times x plus b mod p. So we're doing modular arithmetic. So, so p is some prime number. And then the mod is saying, take the remainder after integer division. Okay, It's just an example of a hash function that combines all three of these things, the value of x, the values of a and b, which are two randomly selected numbers. But what it really sort of causes me to want to ask is, when, when did we generate these numbers? So we're obviously not generating them fresh each time. That's what we did on the previous slide, and we didn't like that hash function. So this time, they're being generated somehow ahead of time. But when? Right? Because if we generate them just once ever, then how can we say that our hash function is random, right? Because basically, there's no chance that we could uh, draw a new, there's no way to draw a new hash function and get a different way of assigning items to different bins if A and B are just set permanently all the time. So there's got to be a point where we can select A and B, and it's before we use the hash function, but it's after we've designed the overall algorithm. Okay, so let's just try to see if we can answer this question, when did we choose A and B? Because this is an important point, and it allows us to see when we later go to define our random variables, it lets us understand a lot better what are they random over, okay? Because this is the choice that they're random over. Okay, so we're going to think of our algorithm as basically proceeding in, or our approach as proceeding in basically three phases. So phase one is we choose the overall algorithm. We're going to build a hash table. We're going to add everything to the hash table. And then we're going to check something about the hash table. You know, whatever. We define in broad terms what's the algorithm uh, we want to run. And once we've defined the algorithm, now we kind of know what we need when it comes to hash functions. We know how many hash functions we need. We know, therefore, how much randomness we need, since the randomness is one of the things we have to put into the hash functions. We know how much of that we need. Then phase two, which happens after phase one, is what I'll call the random interlude. Right? This is where all the random stuff happens. So if we know that we need, for example, 10 hash functions, 10 different hash functions, and all of those 10 hash functions each need three random numbers, well, this is the phase when we would actually go generate all of those 30 total random numbers that we need. And therefore, at, once we're finished with phase two, we can now pin down the hash functions. The hash functions have been chosen. And then phase three is where the action really happens. This is when the data arrives and we can execute our strategy. And we use, of course, the hash functions that we just chose in phase two. All right, the key is that the randomness is isolated and gathered here in just the one phase. It's, it happens in phase two. That's where we do our random draws. So if later we were going to analyze this algorithm using, say, random variables and, and maybe some of those approaches that we saw in the previous uh, lectures, like coupon collector and birthday problem, well, those random variables are modeling a random system. And the randomness comes from, of course, this phase. So the random variables that we can use in the analysis of the overall method are random over, essentially, the choice of hash functions. They're random over choice of hash functions. Okay, 
which happens in phase two. They are not, and this, uh, uh, it's easy to get trapped into thinking this, when we use v random variables to model what's happening in the, in the overall method, the random variables are not describing the input. They're not random over the input data. They're random over the choice of hash function. And this is a good thing because we want, you know, we want our random variables to have the properties we want them to have. If we want to use balls and bins or coupon collector or birthday problem or these other approaches to analyze the state of our data structure, we need to be able to assume that the items were allocated uniformly and independently. Well, we can't assume that the input itself would be uniform and independent. If we were to just make, if we were just to just slot the inputs in, you know, just by taking some deterministic function of the input. So we're not making a distributional assumption about the input. We're not saying the input items are uniformly distributed over the bins. We're saying the output of the hash function is what's uniform and independent. And if we have two hash functions, we can argue those two hash functions are independent from each other and so on. But the randomness that the random variables is modeling is randomness from phase two. We don't need to rely on the input data having those properties. Okay. Now we could say, no, oh, I don't know. This is a little complicated having these three phases. Let's just take out phases one and two. And let's say that we're going to make these assumptions like uniform distribution of input over the hash table. Just transfer those assumptions over to the input. So we're going to assume that the input is uniformly distributed. In other words, the data items that are in our data set are uniformly distributed over the bins of the hash table. Well, that's a very strong assumption. And it's almost certainly not true in practice. It would be very easy to come up with examples where, for reasonable real-world data, there are, it's going to drastically violate the assumption of, of uniform distribution over the, over the uh, hash table. So the ability to work with any kind of input data and still rely on having uniformity and independence, we lose that if we lose the hash functions. Or in other words, the hash functions are this kind of universal adapter that goes from arbitrary input data to a situation where we can make assumptions about how the data is distributed over, let's say, the buckets of a hash table or the bits of a Bloom filter or something else.